I, the Lord thy God, I will march with you. As you raise up the banner higher today than you did yesterday, I will be walking with you. I am calling you to walk like you've never walked before in my strength and in my ability in none of your own. I have come to march with you because we are marching right on up into glory. We are bringing in the harvest of lost souls at this given time and preparing the way for the second coming of my son, Jesus. Much destruction all around about, but my light in you will shine and it will break the darkness. I have been waiting for you to come forth as you did this night and truly praise me from the very depth of your being. You have seen nothing yet, but you wait and see what's going to begin starting tomorrow and never stop. I have brought my legion of angels with me and they, were, they will perform the tasks that need to be performed in the days ahead. They will be with you. They will stand beside you and they will help you fight your battles. You are not going into this battle alone. You are going with all the hosts of heaven by your side. And the battle is going to rage hot and furious. But I tell you this night that you have come up hither and you have held hands with your father and you have said, I'll never look back. So we are going to do some mountain climbing, you and I. And we're going to climb the highest mountains and the highest heights. And we're going to defeat the enemy on all sides. Yes, the enemy is raging. And yes, the enemy's voice is out there loud and clear, trying to muffle my voice. But my people are truly going to rise. And they are going to truly go forth and bring victory in the camps. Oh, the enemy he has really destroyed on the right and on the left. But children, I tell you this night, you are still standing. America is still standing. The world is going to see who I truly am. And you will stand beside me as a mighty army and you will go forth and you will plunder the enemy's camp and you will bring victory after victory after victory before you. You made a choice this night to surrender your all and come on up into the heavenly places with me. That choice will remain. I, the Lord thy father, I am sealing that choice and the enemy will not be able to come in and transgress your choice. Rejoice in me always. As you rejoice this night, rejoice in me always. And let's walk hand in hand and finish the works that I've called you to finish. Thank you. Nancy Willis, do you have a word? Children, you are my soldiers. Thank you, Jesus. And we are marching forth hand in hand. The enemy has no more place in you, and you have defeated him on every turn. Now it's victory time, and it's victory time. And my angels are going to finish up what I have accomplished for them to finish up with. So, children, you be encouraged this night, and you, you continue to follow me with all of your heart with all of your mind, with all of your soul. I have not left you behind. I have not left one stone unturned, but now it's victory time. And dance and dance and dance. Brett, you have a word. Thank you, Jesus. My children, as you have supped and dined with me on this night, I am instilling the greatness of myself in the core of your beings. 
all that you have absorbed and taken in over the years from my spirit is a storehouse within and I'm going to bring out the greatness of my fruit for all the world to see through you that many will be saved by my power and by my spirit that is at work within you. Christopher Gore, you have a word. There's gonna be a greater unity in my bodies. I am teaching you all how to work together in one mind and one accord and in the spirit. There will be no more big eyes and little U's. All of my children will work together. All of my children will propel the glory that I am bringing into this earth realm into the darkness that is coming. Little ones, I want you to know how much I love you, how much I am cheering you on in this hour because of the great things that I'm going to be having you do. This unity that I am bringing is going to astound many. I want you to understand how much I love you and how much I am with you. Do not go backwards anymore. Keep marching forward for this is a day of total and complete victory. You shall see me rise as the lion of the tribe of Judah and you're in that tribe and victory is yours on all sides and in all ways. You shall see your families come in. You shall see your friends come in. You shall see the prodigals come home once and for all. Great celebrations are going on right now in the heavenly realms and all over heaven there are rejoicings and parties and dancings going on. Jump into this realm now. Jump into this party that I have started because it's never going to end. It's just going to increase over and over and exponentially into this earth realm. Catherine Gore, you have a word. It is my spirit, children, my spirit. No more flesh. My spirit will fall upon you like never before. You will be drenched with my glory. Children, the days ahead are dark and evil, but my spirit shall rule and reign in this earth. Be of good cheer. Know that your father is with you. Barbara Alsap, you have a word. My children, I love you so desperately. I want you to come home to me so much, but I need you right now to complete these works here on this earth. My heart is beating for you, and I cannot wait until we complete what needs to be done, and we can rejoice now, but we'll really rejoice when you come up hither with me. Aaron, you have a word. Children, the destitution has already been replaced with every blessing. Walk in that path. See that path this night and stomp your feet in surety of heart and understand that everything that has led up to this moment has passed. And all you have is every blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the truth of your testimony and the depth of my love for you. My sons and my daughters, there's going to be many things that are going to be happening in the world, but you have learned how to look at me and not what's going on around you. No matter how hard the enemy ranges, I am there. I have trained you. I have instilled heart of a warrior in you. And to war we go. And we go dancing. And we go stomping. And we go with great joy.
for it is the beginning of the return of my son and the destruction of evil. I'm just hearing God say that there's self-destruction on all sides. And if you don't walk with a father, you're gonna get caught up into that. And the enemy will take you out. God said we have the power and we have the authority. And the enemy has none. So you have to pick up the power and the authority of God and pay no attention to the enemy. Father, I truly do thank you for coming into our midst tonight as usual. We never take anything for granted. We thank you, Father God, for your angelic host. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that is here to lead, guide, and direct our every words, our every action. And Father God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who loved us so completely that he gave up his life. We ask you, Father, to be in our midst tonight in a way that you never have been before. Bring us, Father God, even higher than we've been before. And teach us of your heavenly kingdom. And Father, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to talk tonight about Overcomers Part 2. We started it Sunday morning, and, and now I'm going to give it the rest of it tonight. We ended Sunday morning with this statement. It is a bitter thing to have others look at your greatest trials, your greatest acts of obedience and faithfulness to God, and to esteem you as a sinner or to consider you to be deluded. The temptations will rise to justify yourself before the eyes of others. You will want others to say, well done, and to encourage you on your path but instead you will receive misunderstanding and discouragement. At this time of temptation, listen to the voice of the Spirit. You will hear him speaking to you and encouraging you to rest and remain silent. He will exhort you to leave your reputation completely in the hands of the Father and to seek only his approval. Those are the things we heard Sunday morning. And you know, God's been telling me that the body of Christ needs to right now enter into his rest. We just need to quit, you know, all the th things that we do and just enter into his rest. And we need, need to allow him uh, to control the situations that are going on around about us instead of us trying to control them ourselves. So I'm just really encouraging you tonight to enter into his rest and really to allow him to fight your battles for you. Now one of the prophets said God spoke to him last week and told him to uh, decorate for Christmas early because he wants us to really enjoy this Christmas to all of its fullest. And then he said, tell my body to start decorating right now for Christmas because Christmas will bring you joy unspeakable this year. So I'm, in, I'm passing that along. And uh, Johnny, you know, he said to me a month ago, I'm going to decorate early. So he's been decorating early. So I said, well, you must have heard from the Holy Spirit. So I'm just, in, and it did, it made us happy and joyful, you know, and to see everything lit up in the trees and everything. So that's all outside. We haven't started inside yet. But I'm just encouraging you because I think that you'll find that it'll bring you a, a sense of joy you haven't had for a while. All right, let's get back to this teaching. Now, if you are concerned that others do not recognize your obedience and you are insistent that they should not acknowledge your faithfulness, you will only become angry and embittered when they don't. Know this with all confidence. God will, in his time, reveal those who are faithful and those who are not. Let's consider David. 
He had the anointing oil poured over his head by the most revered man of God in his day, who was Samuel the prophet. It was prophesied that he was a man after God's heart and that God would establish him as king. So David is the only person in the Bible whose epitaph reads, a man after God's own heart. And that's in 1 Samuel 13, 14 and Acts 13, 22. David was born in 1040 B.C. and before Christ and was the youngest son of Jesse. You'll find that in 1 Samuel 16, 10 through 11. He is described as handsome and ruddy with beautiful eyes. You'll find that in 1 Samuel 16, 2. And you know, as I was reading about him, I thought, I'll bet he had all the women after him. And that's why his wife was so jealous when he danced. <laughs> all right, did anyone acknowledge us about David? Did anyone honor those qualities in David that God was so pleased with? No. David's father thought so little of him that he did not even invite him to meet the prophet Samuel when Samuel told Jesse to bring all of his sons. God looks into the heart in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. God addressed Samuel. So how long are you going to mope over Saul? You know, God had taken the anointing off of Saul. You know I've rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your flask with anointing oil and get going. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've spotted the very king I want among his sons. See that? And Samuel said, I can't do that. Saul will hear about it and kill me. Now, I thought this was sort of neat. Look how God, what God told him to do. And God said, take a heifer with you and announce, I've come to lead you in worship of God with the heifer as a sacrifice. God could have kept Saul from killing Samuel, but God's telling him to do it this way. Make sure Jesse gets invited. I'll let you know what to do next. I'll point out the one you are to anoint. Samuel did what God told him. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the town fathers greeted him but apprehensively. Is there something wrong? Everybody was really afraid of, this, of the prophet in those days. Is something wrong? Nothing's wrong. I've come to sacrifice this heifer and lead you in the worship of God. Prepare yourselves, be consecrated, and join me in worship. He made sure Jesse and his sons were also consecrated and called to worship. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, here is, he is, God's anointed. Samuel thought the wrong person was God's anointed, a prophet. All right? But God told Samuel, looks aren't everything. Don't be impressed with his looks and stature. I've already eliminated him. God judges persons differently than humans do. Men and women look at the face. God looks into the heart. Jesse then called up Abadab and presented him to Samuel. And Samuel said, this man isn't God's choice either. See, Samuel's starting to get wise, right? Next, Jesse presented Shema. Samuel said, no, this man isn't either. Jesse presented his seven sons to Samuel. Samuel was blunt with Jesse. God hasn't chosen any of these. Then he asked Jesse, is this it? Are there no more sons? Well, yes, there's one, there's a runt, but he's out tending the sheep. Samuel ordered Jesse, go get him. We're not moving from this spot until he's here. Jesse sent for David. He was brought in the very picture of health. He was brought in the very picture of health, bright-eyed, good-looking. And God said, up on your feet, anoint him. This is the one. Samuel took his flask of oil and anointed him. With his brother standing around watching, the Spirit of God entered David like a rush of wind, God vitally empowering him for the rest of his life. Samuel left and went home to Ramah. But he was a very young man, but when God anointed him right then, God's spirit went into him, even though he didn't become king at that moment. And the rest of his life, the anointing was in David. It never left David. You have to remember that. God might have picked you in your mother's womb to be a king. I'll just say the word king. And when he did, the anointing was in you, and the anointing never left you. No matter where you're at, what you were doing, the anointing was always there. 
So, okay, his brother saw all this, right? So let's go to 1 Samuel 17, 28. David, who was talking to the men, you know, David went out to see about the fight with the Goliath. And so David, who was talking to the men standing around him, asked, what's in it for the man who kills the, that Philistine and gets rid of this ugly blot on Israel's honor? Who does he think he is anyway? This uncircumcised Philistine taunting the armies of God alive. They told him that everyone was saying about what the king would do for the man who killed the Philistine. Now Elab, his oldest brother, heard when, he, when David spoke to the men, and Elab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? <laughs> Is there not a cause? <laughs> you know, his brother knew he was anointed to be king, but still he disrespected him. See that? People are not going to respect you. I don't care how great your anointing is. They're just not going to respect you. Then after Samuel anointed David, Jesse sent David back out to tend the sheep. You know, his, brother, his father still didn't see any good in him. Said, said to him, saying, when do your other guys tend, tend to sheep? Now we have an anointed king in the house. He said, David, back out to tend to sheep. So, you know, you might know that you're anointed of God, but nobody's going to respect you. And you aren't supposed to try to make people respect you. God, in due time, will show people who you really are. All right, did anyone acknowledge this? Did anyone honor those qualities in David that God was so pleased with? No. David's own family did not see in him the things that so captivated the heart of God. David was esteemed very little in the eyes of his family. Isn't that what happened to Jesus? His own family didn't esteem him as a Messiah. In fact, his brothers mocked him. Even though Saul brought David into his house, Saul became jealous of David because he saw that God was with him. And you'll find that in 1 Samuel 18 too. Saul did not acknowledge that David was pleasing to God, nor did he give him honor. Instead, Saul sought to kill David without a cause. 1 Samuel 22, 3, you know, Saul saw how David killed Goliath at a young, as he was a young boy, and he said he wanted him to come to his home and stay there, which he did. And every time the enemy, you know, the, the uh, demon entered Saul, if David played his harp, the demons left and gave Saul peace. But Saul was still jealous of David. In 1 Samuel 22, 3 and 4, then David went to Mespoth in Moab. He petitioned the king of Moab, grant asylum to my father and mother until I find out what God has planned for me. See, David's putting his mother and father in safety. God could have kept them safe. Uh, this nothing against David. I'm just showing you David, even though he was anointed to be king, still had to protect his family. David left his parents in the care of the king of Moab. They stayed, stayed there all through the time David was hiding out. So here we are. We have David. Then, you know, he went to the cave, and this is the king, anointed king. David went to a cave and hid out. So if you go to a cave and hide out, don't worry about it. <laughs> David did the same thing. In Psalm 27, 9 through 10, David says, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. See that? David saying, Everybody else has forsaken me, God. Please don't you forsake me too. That's what he's saying here. He said, when everything's going down, I know you're going to take care of me. So how many of you sitting here today, your family has forsaken you. You know, they, they, they belittle, belittle you, and they can't understand what's going on with you. They've forsaken you, but you have to cry out to God, don't you forsake me too. You know, be there for me when I need you. What bitterness, but bitterness it must have been to David for his family to forsake him and to not understand that he was suffering unjustly. Same thing happened to Jesus. The same thing happens to some people in the body of Christ. For many years, David walked in wilderness places, 
where he, where he was humiliated time and again. At his lowest point, the very men who attached themselves to him spoke of stoning him. When did they do that? At his very lowest point. When are going to people going to forsake you? At your very lowest point. When you think they're going to rise up and be with you, they walk away from you. And 1 Samuel 25, verse 10 says, Nabal accused David of being an unfaithful servant to King Saul when David had been the most faithful of servants. And Nabal accused David of having rebelliously broken off from Saul when the truth was that Saul was seeking to kill David without a reason. See how this works? In great anger and exasperation, David responded from his soul and he and his men went forth with the intent to kill every member of Nabal's household. Yet God sent an intercessor in the form of Nabal's wife, Abigail, to keep David from taking vengeance into his own hand. David listened to the voice of Abigail, and he was genuinely grateful that he did not, did not carry out the rash, rash action that his soul was leading him to perform. Watch what you do when you're upset and everybody's rejecting you. In 1 Samuel 25, verse 32, And David said, Blessed be God, the God of Israel. He sent you to meet me. He was talking to Abigail. And blessed, me, blessed be your good sense. In other words, Abigail had more sense than he did at that point. He was anointed king. Bless you for keeping me from murder and taking charge of looking out for me. See that? God will send somebody to you and intervene when you're going to do something stupid. <laughs> when you're at your lowest point, that's when you do stupid things. All right, God's people who journey to Zion will encounter many events similar to this one. People will deliberately interpret events in a manner that is inconsistent with the judgment of God. These are things people's going to do to you. They will speak evil of your good works, and they will reproach you for your obedience. The tendency of the flesh and soul of man is to respond in defense of one's reputation, even as David set out to do when he was going to kill her husband. Yet God will send an intercessor in the form of his spirit to counsel you us to not go down this path nor to take up the sword in defense of ourselves. And you know, I'm guilty of this because just the other night I, I cried out to God and said, God, why? Why is all my life with you, people have been coming against me? Why? You know, we already know because you were, some are born for sorrow, you're born for sorrow, and this is going to happen to you. All right? So we need to quit asking why because you just have to repent. You just wasted a whole lot of breath for nothing. <laughs> all right? You really should just be rejoicing that you're being come against because that makes you know that the enemy knows the power and authority that you have in Christ and he knows who you are and he's trying to destroy you. So I don't want to see no more of this, this junk that you throw out there. <laughs> Why me, Lord? <laughs> now you all said amen, so you better me believe that, mean that. Abigail healed David's wounded spirit by telling him that he would surely see the fulfillment of all the things God had promised him. And that's in 1 Samuel 25, 28 through 30. In the same way the spirit binds up our hearts, our hurts, and reminds us of the calling set before us in the surety of our inheritance if we will continue to walk faithfully before God. You know, whenever you're, you have a high calling upon your life, it's really a, it's really a lonely place to be because nobody understands you. And I don't care what you do, they always talk evil about you. And even, if you're, even if you're helping people, they still turn around and come against you and talk about you. I've spent close to 40 years of living this, so I know what I'm talking about. And, you know, you've done absolutely nothing wrong <laughs> except serve God. And do what God's telling you to do. But every place you turn. And you know, the thing that will hurt you the most is whenever you have people in your congregation. This happened to me years ago. And you know, and you laid out your, you know, you just gave your life for these people. And then they all of a sudden one day decide that you're evil. 
and they go tell people about it. They bring their pastor in here, and she stands between me and them because I'm the devil. And she tells me so to my face. And the woman's sitting there s smiling because now this pastor thinks I'm evil. That was the biggest hurt that I ever went through because I thought, I mean, I love these people, and I thought they loved me. They're the ones that taught me how to get in this building. Amen. <laughs> then they left me and talked about me. I'm just warning you, this is what's going to happen to you. This is what happened to Jesus. This is what happened to the disciples. Are you able to carry this load? You and people come against you wrongly. All right, where am I at here? The Spirit would entreat us to not use a sword in our own defense. What is a sword that we are tempted to take up? The tongue. Proverbs 12, 18, there is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. The truthful lips shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. <clears throat> Please don't try to, to vindicate yourself. God will do that at the proper time. If you really walk in the spirit, you will always know when the, God might tell you something, but you, you, you won't be able to give it until it's the right time. And then at the right time, everything comes out smoothly. The person you're ministering to will receive it. And then God's glory is shown. Amen. All right? So everything you hear from God, you don't need to go spill your guts about it. You just need to hold on to it and, and wait for God to bring it out. I'm just going to give you an example. Years ago, the Lord told my grandson, you will serve me. You will. You will, you know. It, it, it can be in jail or out of jail. It's totally up to you. And he's in jail right now. And, and he's really, you know, upset. And uh, finally, last night when I was talking to him, the spirit got on me. And I said, honey, I need to tell you something. Please don't get mad at me. And I reminded him of what God said. And I said, maybe you need to start talking to Jesus. He never said a word. He didn't get upset with me. But I know that I know if I'd have said it any other time except last night, at that time, he wouldn't have received it. Are you understanding this? And then, see, the car it carried on over during the night. Uh, you know, I was in my office praying and everything, and I was getting a song service together, and this song came on, Why Me, Lord? And I knew God wanted me to give that to him, so I looked up the words to it. And then there was two other songs, I can't remember the titles, but they were all, you know, how could you love me when I'm so dirty? You know, and so I printed them out. The next song came on, it was nothing. No anointing, it was a good song, no anointing, no nothing. In fact, I had to turn it off. But those three, and I don't know why those that song came up, but the other two followed, I do. It was the Spirit of God. And they are the songs that he's gonna read I mailed him out this morning, and that's going to be the icing on the cake. And that's what's going to cause him to repent. And turn. He's not a bad person at all. Got into drugs like everybody, a lot of other people do. But if you really walk in the Spirit, God will always tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Is what I'm saying. And we, we can't think, well, I, I'm just going to show them that I hear God's voice. You can't do that. You know you hear God's voice, so listen to what he's telling you. Then at the right moment, God will bring it back up again, and he'll be there, and he'll speak through your lips. All right? All right, do not allow your anguish and pain to lead you to speak heart ra rash words in defense of yourself. If you're like me, there's many times you wanted to, to defend yourself. But God said, don't do that. Just don't do that. I will do it in due time. And since we're called the Philadelphia Church, I really lean on that very heavily because God says in there that he will cause our enemies to come and sit at our feet. He will vindicate us. And if you're really part of the Lighthouse Church and you're the Philadelphia Church, it applies to you as it does to me. All right? 
there's always going to be troubles on all sides. But God already knew they're going to be there. And he already has a solution. So let's just let him take care of, the, care of it. Do not give in to the temptation to slash and cut others in retaliation for their condemnation and misjudgment of your faithful walk. The first thing a lot of people do, well, I've got something bad on them too. The devil said that to me one time when I was still in deliverance here. He said, I know all about your mother. I said, shut up. <laughs> See, he, was being, he was being defeated and he, he wondered to get my attention on that. I said, you shut up and come out. You know, and sometimes we want to do that. We just pull back into our little mind and we see all the dirty things somebody else has done. So we're going to pull that forth and we're going to throw that at you and you're going down, not me. We can't do that. We really can't. First Peter 4.14, 4, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. See that? You're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on, you, on your part, he is glorified. I was having a fuss with my two boys the other day, and God said, who's a grown-up here? <laughs> Why are you reacting like this? I'd gotten down to their level, and I was arguing with them. You see, see what, what he's saying here? Always stay up in the, in the heavenlies. Don't let anything or anybody drag you down to their level. Yes, it brings glory to God when we restrain our lips. When we are reviled, we are to speak a blessing in return. When men and women do not understand, when family and friends condemn our walk, we are to entrust our reputation to the hands of the Father. And in due time, he will manifest his righteous servants. Some of you have been walking through this all your life, and you just need to get out of that walk. Those who would be citizens of Zion must rule over their tongues. In Psalm 141.3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. We need that. We need to memorize that verse. <laughs> Amen. Something happened to me about a week ago, and, and I said, I know it's the devil working through them, but I like to take their head and stick it in a bucket of water. You know, <laughs> you know it, it, I really wouldn't do that, but... You know, I say stuff like that every now and then. <laughs> get that to get that all that mess out of me, you know, then I then I say, God, you you know, you know what's going on, you just take care of it. Amen. <laughs> do not seek to justify yourself, but allow room for the Father to do so. It, it could be your kids, it could be your husband, your wife, it could be the person you're sitting next to in church. Go, the Satan's going to use anybody that's open, you know, to come against you. D don't allow him to, to, to stir the muddy waters. You stay pure and holy like God has called you to be and, and pray for those who come against you. You know, if, if you're really in the right you know, in, in the Philadelphia church, God said, I'm going to make them come and sit at your feet and they're going to know your mind. So in other words, God's going to make them come and apologize to you Amen. instead of you retaliate and doing all kind of junk. You know, you just be quiet. And it's the hardest thing you can do. It really is. I'm here to tell you it is. It's not a simple thing when somebody's trying to take you down or, or you know, into, suck you into some hole and out there talking evil about you. You know, I've had people say, I would never say anything bad about you. But guess what? I, it's come back to me. They, they didn't only say bad. They said terrible things about me. You know, so don't ever say you won't do that. Okay, Proverbs 27, 2 says, Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. You don't have to glorify yourself. The road to Zion is a pathway of humility. You know, with, when Sister Barbara was going through her problems, she was going through with another organization, you know, I told her, I said, just, just be quiet. God's going to vindicate you. God has this in his hands. You know, she was going to go out there and chop their heads off. It's the biggest axe she could find, you know. <laughs> but, you know, you know, I said, just, God's going to, God has this. And he, do, he did, and it turned out great, you know. But if she'd have got her axe, she wouldn't have been where she's at tonight. <laughs> But I have a bucket of water. She had an axe, okay? 
I want to drown you. She wants you to cut your head off. <laughs> no different, is it? And you keep saying, God, vindicate me, God, vindicate me, God, vindicate me, then that's a problem too. Yes. You just have to know that he's going to. I always pray a blessing over the person. I really do. And once, once I get them out of the bucket of water, then, <laughs> then I pray a blessing over them. You're supposed to bless your enemies, right? And that's what you have to do. If you want the same thing in your life, you're going to have to put it out there first. All right? All right, the road to Zion is a pathway of humility. If you can be evil spoken of and not speak a word of rebuttal or retaliation, then you have chosen righteously and are being conformed to the image of Christ. Read that again. If you can be evil spoken of and not speak a word of rebuttal or retaliation, then you have chosen righteously and are being conformed to the image of Christ. If you can earnestly pray that those who have misjudged you should be forgiven and their trans trespass is not held against them, then you are making progress towards Zion's gates. You know, I had a, somebody was on drugs in my house, and I told him, you've got to quit doing drugs. You can't be here with my children any longer. Just a couple months ago. So they packed her. They said, I understand. Packed her bags and left, went on the streets. And they told their mother and everybody else, I kicked them out. <laughs> I didn't kick them out. I said, you can go to rehab, but you can't stay here with all the drugs that you're doing. They kicked their own stuff out, right? They chose the drugs. And, and I got phone calls and stuff. How could you do that? You're a pastor. How could you do that? And I said, I didn't do it. <laughs> I said, they did it to themselves, and then I let it go. And they're still talking about it, but I could care less. I know what I did. All right, it takes faith to remain silent when being falsely condemned. You guys have to get this in your spirit. It takes faith to remain silent when being falsely condemned. This saint must believe that although man judges many things falsely, God will judge with righteousness and fairness. The saint must believe his or her vindication will come. The, the saint is y'all that their obedience will have its reward in the hour appointed by God. Only by having this faith can the saint be at peace. Only then can the lambs of God remain silent. May you know this peace this evening, for surely the promise of God are on the way. What they say, Jesus was led away like a lamb to the slaughter and said not a word. It amazes me with the Lighthouse Church, if I don't talk to you for a week or something right away, you think I'm conjuring up something bad against you. I am so busy, I can't even talk to myself sometimes, <laughs> right? Come on. It really, really, if, if I had something against you, you'd get an email <laughs> real quick like, <laughs> then you wish you hadn't heard from me. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, you're growing up, right? And you don't have to hear from somebody every day. And, you know, and I'm depending on you to carry on while I'm carrying on with the things I'm going to carry on with. Yes. All right? Yes. All right, so today I ordered oil for the church, 570 some dollars. I said, where are you getting this price from? Diesel fuel. You know, they go by the highest price of, so what's your oil, if you have oil, what's your oil bill going to be when you fill up again? So this is the type of stuff I'm you know, dealing with, and you're sitting at your house. I know she has odd against me, and I know this, and I, oh, get out of here. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, just quit your stupid thinking, right? Let's just go ahead and be, be one body, one mind, one accord, and let's just do the things God's calling us for to do. Do you know why marriages go wrong? Because husbands and wives sit and think dumb stuff like that. Oh, she didn't say good morning to me. So I wonder what she, I bet she's cheating on me. You know, the, all, you, know you start all this junk, right? It, isn't, that tr isn't that true? Say amen. Thank you. Same way with kids. I bet my kids are out there doing this, that, and you. And, you know, and they're not. I bet they're doing this and that. They're thinking this and that. They're not. You know, I, I sit down and talk to my boys, find out where they're at. I don't sit and wonder where they're at because I can waste an awful lot of time doing that with a nine-year-old and a 15-year-old. I'm glad you have six or eight, and I only have two. Amen. 
I know they're thinking, well, she ought to try to deal with eight. No, I don't think that. I just thank God that you were dumb and I wasn't. <laughs> you know, my first husband said, I went 12 kids, and I said, I don't think so. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> so are you are you understanding being an overcomer in this dumb area of your life of wanting people to always like you? You know? If people aren't always going to like you. Let me tell you something. How, how many times maybe you don't like your own self? So why are you expecting everybody else to like you? And how many times you don't understand what God's doing with you, so why do you want other people to understand what you're doing when you don't understand what you're doing? See how this is working? It keeps the body of Christ in disunity. And we're supposed to be overcomers to overcome this type of petty junk and not even go there. We have more important things to think about, and that is the harvest that God is trying to bring in and and what is our part to play in that harvest? All right. Just you know, the other day, God told me that whenever President Trump runs for presidency, the reason why the devil's dragging this out and not letting him be in office right now is that the people are going to get tired of hearing his name and tired of him, and they won't vote for him. That's what God told me. And then the sister back there told me that some people said they wouldn't vote for him. Why? Because all the junk's going on. This is how the devil works. And I hope he doesn't get into this here, vindicate me stuff. And I prayed about it the other night. I said, God, if you want him in office, he'll be in office. You know, th that's the way you need to pray. If you don't know how to pray, say, God, your will be done in this situation. You know? God, this is what I want to happen. God doesn't care what you want to happen. I'm, I want that's might be new, bad news to you, but that's the truth. He wants His will done in your life. So let's just put God in the center, and let's just throw out our dumped thinking, and let's just let God do what He. You know, God, let God run the world. Our job is to pray, right? We can't run the world. We already know we messed it up bad. So we already know we tried that. It didn't work. Let God run the world. Our job is to pray. And if you're like me and even Chris Gore, we were talking, and even Adam, God has us praying a lot. Even you, Grace. He's been having us pray a lot here lately. In fact, you're praying more than you are doing anything else. That's our job right now, to be praying. Quit trying to make people like you. You know, I really don't care if you like me or not. You know, I didn't come to your house and say, please, please, please come to church. I didn't do that. The Holy Spirit brought you into the house of God because the Holy Spirit wanted you to hear this message. You know, and if you feel like you don't want to listen to me, you can get up and walk out the door. The, the usher will trip you as you go, but you're free to go. <laughs> no, he wouldn't do that for nothing. Do you see what I'm saying? Quit thinking, oh, i got to sit here. They're going to upset me. They're going to get upset with you if, no matter what you do. Well, oh, I don't like their music. That's all right. I've been in church that didn't like their music, but it stayed because I was a speaker. <laughs> but, you know, let's just quit this petty stuff is what I'm trying to get across. And God's trying to get, this is not really how I was going to do this, but this is how God is doing it. I, isn't our God good? Don't you think it was wonderful how he had, how had each one of you, if you listen to what each person was saying, it was building upon the other? Don't, don't you think that's wonderful God does things like that? You know, man can't conjure that up. But God can do all things. Amen. All things. So how many of you are ready now to just sow this stupid thing, I want everybody to light me out the window? Okay. Do you really want to get rid of that spirit? Then the altar's open for that, for God to give you strength to quit wanting people to, even you kids in, in your homes, quit wanting want your parents to love you. Either they're going to love you or they're not. And you can't force their emotions, right? So kids, just, just say, God, you're my father, you love me, and you deal with my parents if they're not treating you right. 